we wanted to run this one just a little bit different and have it be a little bit more kind of conversational, just to just to switch up the the, the format a little bit and uh, and tackle the passage in a little bit of a different way. So Tim, I'll let you kind of start us off, and then we're going to read through our passage here in just a moment. Okay. Now, I know that you all believe in miracles, right? So. Um, we're going to need a miracle in that we need to keep this short, okay? I mean, it's great because I'm right here, so if I can be like, <laughs> so, so the point is. <laughs> the point is, is this. Well, uh, let me just What you're start trying to get at is, I'm yeah. just kidding. I'll stop. But, <laughs> let me just start by saying that over the past uh, three weeks, uh, we have been encouraged. I certainly have been, been encouraged. I hope that you have been encouraged by Nehemiah's example of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem when they lay in ruin. As we rebuild our North Point family and community. Now, we are able to identify with Nehemiah because of the loss that we have experienced over the past year and a half, two years. There's been many losses. And like God's people in Nehemiah's day, we have grieved over, over where we once were as a North Point family and where we are today. Would you agree? Yeah. It's been tough. It's still tough. And we were reminded by Nehemiah that he was very, very burdened by the fact that the walls were destroyed. Things were not the way they once were. Now, in spite of Nehemiah's grief, in spite of our grief, we're encouraged to make ourselves available in the midst of the ruin, in the midst of the loss. Make ourselves available for God to do something special in our North Point family. We build our North Point family and community. And in making ourselves available, we were reminded by uh, Nehemiah and God's people that it wasn't just one or two that helped rebuild the walls. It was all of them working together. We need each other. And we can't do this without the help of each other stepping in, working side by side, working together. Now, as we take our Bibles and we turn to Nehemiah chapter 4, we read that although the re rebuilding of the walls is well on its way, and like ourselves, we've taken some significant steps to get moving to rebuild our church family, although the walls were well on their way, so was the threat to be able to stop, hinder the work that was needing to be finished. And North Point family, this is no less true for us, right, Pastor Spencer? There's going to be ongoing opposition. That is a given. And as we look into this chapter, I really believe that Father God wants to encourage us that in spite of the opposition that we will continue in the midst of our pain and hurt, make ourselves available and continue to work together, we will see God glorified. We will see God do something significant as a result. So, Let's take our Bibles. Let's get into the passage. And let's start at verse 1. And Pastor Spencer, if you could lead us in that. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Verse 11. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to be reading verses 1 to 11 of chapter 4. And it starts like this. It says, When Sanballat heard that they were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life 
from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down the, their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them up, or pardon me, give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builder. And I just want to stop there. That's the end of verse 5. The way that it's structured here, that those last couple verses are in Nehemiah leading the community really in, in, a, in, a, in a prayer at that point, picking back up at verse 6. It says this, so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of uh, to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, they, uh, pardon me, had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were ve very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, their strength of the laborers is given out, giving out, and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Verse 11, also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to their work. And moving on to verse 12, when the Jews who lived near them came, they said to us ten times, from all the places where they live, they will come up against, um, they will come up against us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, their bows. After I looked these things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles and the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your kin, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. There's a message itself right there. When our enemies heard that their plot was known to us and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction half held the spears, shields, bows, and body armor, and the leaders posted themselves behind the whole house of Judah who were building the wall. The burden bearers carried their loads in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and with the other hand a weapon. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread out, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Rally to us whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night inside of Jerusalem so that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard uh, who followed me ever took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon in his right hand. Wow, what a passage. I want to just give a very, very quick over, overview of uh, our passage. And then Pastor Spencer and I are going to go into a bit of a question-answer time. And depending on how the Lord leads, have you involved as well. So as a quick overview, we read in verses 1 to 3 that there are two individuals. Do you remember their names? Hard to pronounce. What was it, huh? Sambalat and Tobiah. Yeah, Sambalat and Tobiah, two individuals. And, and what do we find them doing? We find them mocking the people's efforts to rebuild the walls, right? 
So, what does Nehemiah do? Well, he does what most all of us would do. Something like that would happen. We, we go to God in prayer. We take it to him. And that's exactly what Nehemiah does. He goes to God. He says, okay, we will continue to rebuild the walls. But, Father God, we need you to put a stop to this. Does God put a stop to it? Doesn't look that way, does it? Because as we read on in our passage, seven to eight, matters actually get worse. Doesn't get better. Have you ever felt like that when you've gone to God in prayer? And you go, is he not listening to me? Things don't seem to be get, getting better. They seem to be getting worse. We see that to be the case here. We'll revisit that later. So, realizing the danger that they are faced with, we move from verse 9 on through to the end of the passage that Nehemiah sets up a guard day and night to protect God's people so that they can continue to rebuild the walls. And that's where we are right now. And so I'm going to pass it over to you, Spencer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about as we were prepping for this is, uh, I mean, and even as we talked about uh, this with our, our little kids thing to start with here, uh, we all kind of have our own sand ballots and Tobias in our, in our life, don't we? Uh, and, and I was wondering if you could comment on that uh, briefly. Oh, right. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so while I'm comment, I know that each one of us could give an example of wanting to move forward with serving God, even within the context of our North Point family, and uh, having to face maybe some criticism, uh, disappointment. I know for myself, me and Roxanne, uh, when we start, started to let people know that we were planning on leaving the church that we were fellowshipping with, actually pastoring, um, to go to North Africa, man, uh, we got a lot of pushback, didn't we, Han? And not just pushback from people that uh, were acquaintances, actually close people to us. And uh, with very discouraging comments, uh, which really surprised us. We thought, like, man, they get behind us, support us, you know, with what we believe God was asking us to do. And, uh, and, and so uh, we struggled. We struggled with that. Some of the comments that uh, were shared with us was, uh, it's dangerous where you're going. You shouldn't be going there. Remember that, huh? No names. But people are very close to us. I have one colleague in ministry say to me, well, what are you doing? Tim, how long have you been in ministry? So I told him, over 25 years. He said, man, you should be thinking about taking it easier not making it more difficult. Do you realize where you're going is going to be far more difficult? I said, yeah. A and besides, uh, you should be preparing for your retirement. This is what he told me. I said, preparing for my retirement? Yeah, he says, you know, you're going to take a pay cut going overseas. And uh, I don't think that's going to be good for you when it comes to your retirement. And, and I could go on and on, like all the discouraging comments that were being made. Yeah, we've had our Sambalet and uh, Tobias in our life that would have discouraged us from continuing to serve God uh, with our, all of our heart, soul, minds, and strength. You know, that was interesting, Tim, because we, we didn't really dive into it in the passage. We didn't talk about this either. But as, you, as we read, I, I can't remember, I think it was in maybe verse 4 of chapter 4, and it talks about uh, Samuel having the army of Samaria. 
And these are, these are Samaritans, cousins to, to the Jews in a sense. And so as you talk about having, you know, people that, that you knew that you cared about, that uh, I, I don't want to say that we're your adversaries in this. That wouldn't be the, quite the right way of describing it. But, you know, that, that would kind of fill this role in your mind. It's very interesting because these people also had a degree of connection with, with the, the Jewish culture, right? And, and yet they were adversaries to the rebuilding of the wall in this. So that was just a comment that came into my mind as, as, as you were telling this right now and as I was thinking to what, what we just read here. So just kind of an interesting mm -hmm. thought there. And, and with that, I think it would make it a little bit harder with the second question here. Uh, how do you know when it's not time to move on, but rather to press into something, especially when... It's people that have a degree of connection with you. It's one thing if it's people that you maybe mm. have very little association with or that you don't know yeah. intimately. It's yeah. one thing if people like that are saying, you know, certain things or that are, or, you know, calling you out or, or whatever. But how do you know, especially when people that you care about are saying, oh, maybe it's time to move on or not do whatever the thing is. Right. How do you know it's time to press in even more? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's a question as I pondered that. That would be a question that Nehemiah would have asked. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure of it. You know, do we continue this difficult task or, or do I just move on? And um, for me to, in response to this question, how do we know when it's time to move on but rather press in? I, I think we need to, to be brutally honest with ourselves. Uh, what's the motive? What's our motive behind uh, leaving or staying? Um, when I asked myself, what is my true motive for um, going overseas, I realized that the most obvious answer would surface immediately. And here's the obvious answer. For years, I preached about taking the good news to the ends of the earth. And I've always believed that in leadership, we need to lead by example. And it, I was convicted for a number of years that we, Roxanne and I, should do just that, go and serve overseas. And so uh, for me, the obvious reason would be that. I, I thought, yeah, my motives are good. But as I thought more about it, certain questions began to surface in my mind that I really needed to wrestle through. We had been pastoring this church for 19 years, and the question that surfaced was, am I running from a difficult situation? That question was raised in my mind because I have seen that to be the case having passed it for a number of years. People leaving because it just got too difficult. Tim, are you leaving because there's something unfinished business back where you've been serving? And so wrestling through that, and I remember asking dad, saying, Father, search my heart. See if there be some not wicked way in me, but ulterior motives. I need to know that. And it was, it was so refreshing to know, no, I'm not running from a difficult situation. As a matter of fact, many in our congregation did not want us to leave. It made it even more difficult. Um, another question that came to my mind was, uh, you may find this humorous, but I'll be honest, was I bored? Was I looking for something new, a new adventure? I mean, I've been there for 19 years. As I thought about that, I said, hmm, I wouldn't be choosing North Africa as a place that I would go for an adventure right now, especially where we believed we were headed in North Africa. Um, and I won't go any further than that. So that ruled out that. That's not what was in my mind at all. The other question that surfaced really caught me off guard was, do you think you'd be more valuable to God going elsewhere than serving here? 
Wow, I had to really wrestle that with that one. Did I think it was more valuable in the eyes of God? And I talked to Dad about that. Do you want to know what he said to me? It was awesome. I actually shared it with one of our team members who was struggling with the same question, but in, in a bit of a different context. And Father God said to me, Tim, I do not place any more value on you as my son. Roxanne is my daughter. You were to serve here or over there. Serving over there is just an invitation. I want you to consider. And there's so much more to the story, and it includes fly fishing, but I don't have time to get into it, that God brought to my attention. It was profound. And uh, so I think what I'm saying by this is, how do we know when it's time to move on or to press in? I think we first of all have to really be honest, brutally honest with our motives. Come before the Father, ask him, search my heart, see what's really going on in there. And then the next thing I think is really, really important, important is, is uh, spiritual discernment. Uh, and when I say spiritual discernment, I'm talking about involving other godly people to discern with us. Not people that will, um, what's the word uh, I'm looking for here? Those who will, will say what we want them to say, you know? But no, like godly people. That's very important. And discern through the word of God. Really get close to God's word. What are the principles of God's word? For example, if I was to leave with a poor attitude, I cannot say that my motives are right. It's not a right reason. Maybe going and serving in another place is a right reason, but the motives behind it is not right. So getting into God's word and really letting Father God speak to us through his word, target those areas of our life, godly principles, very important. And lastly, prayer, which we've talked about in brief. Uh, coming to Father God in prayer. I remember uh, Roxanne and I going on a three-day spiritual retreat to discern God's will together. Not always the easiest thing to do because our emotions get in the way and, you know, uh, our thoughts. And But we, uh, God brought across our path an article. How to discern God's will as a couple. Excellent. We went on this three-day spiritual retreat with that in hand, and we used that tool. And so we would go away alone for the morning, uh, we, working with step one of this tool. And then we would come back, and we would share, what, what, is, what is Dad saying to you, Rock? And Rock would say, well, what's Dad saying to you? And we compare notes. It was an amazing process that we went through. And if you want that article, I'd be glad to give it to you because it's an excellent tool. So coming back to your question, so, so important for us to really be brutally honest with ourselves and our motives and then to really, really, truly seek the heart of the Father, his will, uh, by going to godly people, getting into the word, Spend, go on a spiritual retreat, seek again the direction of the Father in light of what we're deciding. Ah. I mean, I'll tell a story in a second. We are, we're running a little short. Yeah. Time. That's the usual. But I'll tell a story here in a second that, that makes me think about that. But it, it can be so hard when we're going through mm. challenges to feel, you know, a cognitive and an, an emotional attack from the enemy. Maybe it's not from the enemy. Maybe it's even 
just internally there's this battle that's going on. What, what are some ways that we can be addressing that and surrendering, surrendering our, our, our thoughts, surrendering our emotions at the foot of the cross and allowing the Spirit mm. to be speaking to us and ministering to us mm. as we're even walking through this kind of a challenge and as we're, um, as we're, as we're wrestling with these, with, with these decisions? Mm. I, I, I think the thing that really stands out to me uh, with that question uh, is a verse that I have referred to so many times, and many of us know it. It actually really fits in with the Nehemiah because uh, of the word guard, you know, how Nehemiah set up guard day and night. Um, it's in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. We, we know the, the, the passage well. You know, be anxious about nothing. But everything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And here it is, church. And the peace of God, which goes beyond understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I think that is what is most significant. Um, we need to place a guard before our mind and our heart. And when we talk about our heart, I think about our emotions. Uh, and when I think about our mind, I think of our thought life. Um, when do we become anxious? It's when our heart and mind get away with us. The negativity, the what ifs even. Man, that does a number on us. You know what I found in my experience, Pastor Spencer? I tend to react when that begins to happen. But if my mind is focused on God's word and my emotions are in tune with him and his heart, oh my, there is a peace. There is a peace that comes over me that enables me to respond in a healthy way, not react, but respond. And I find it interesting the heart and the mind are intertwined which whatever you think you feel, whatever you feel is connected with how you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And it says here in Philippians 4, and the, and the context here is one of conflict and anxiety, that our minds and hearts are to be in where? Christ Jesus, connected with him. So I think we really need to put a guard before us in response to your question. And and go from there. Yeah. Sure. And maybe I'll. Uh, we didn't. We didn't plan this. What? Maybe in a, in a really tangible way. What would what would that guard be? You know, we talk about putting a, a guard in front of us. Mm. Like, how how would you describe what that guard? Like in in my in my life today, right yeah. now. What what does the guard look uh, like? Okay, so let me give you a, an example that happened this morning. Um, so I'm thinking about us doing this, and we've never done this before. It's been years since I've done this kind of thing. And you're wondering, you know, how is this going to yeah. approach? And so w because of the what ifs and wondering, you start to become anxious, right? Interesting. I walk into the prayer room, the pre-service prayer time. Evelyn has worship music playing. I went, oh, it just... It touched my heart and soul. And the lyrics began to replace the thoughts with wholesome thought. Isn't that interesting? That's in Philippians 4 too. And you didn't even know that, Evelyn. But I did thank you for the worship as I walked into that room. To me, that's a practical way. That's so good. And those it's, it's those things that bring you back to center, right? And those are going to be different for all of us, potentially. But there will be things that are consistent. Like I'm sure that you're, I would guarantee you're not the only one in this room that when you hear music, especially worship music that you know, it does something to oh. you, right? Isn't that incredible? Look at that right? first course that Gary led totally, us in. Sing right? hallelujah. Yeah. Man, I had yeah. to clap right. Yeah, yeah. Like it and just I mean, grabbed a hold totally. of Totally. And I didn't, I didn't say it today, although, uh, I don't know where you are, Gary. Gary, thank you. Great. Great choice in songs. Maybe he's out there. Okay. 
Uh, but likewise, like last week as well, and just like having these songs that we remember and know that kind of bring us back to center, right? And that, that goes exactly into the story that, that I'd shared as we were kind of prepping and that you were exactly a part of. So it was not this past Friday, but the Friday before, I was just feeling incredibly riled up and anxious about mm. just everything. It was uh, things where I was feeling overwhelmed by mm. things. It's like, there's no way that I can get all of this uh, done, not that, I mean, thinking particularly in the context of North Point, not that it's all on me, but I was just feeling the weight of the things that were before me, that were before us, and and it was f frustrating, And but I was like, don't just sit in this frustration, yeah. don't allow it to control mm. the narrative in a way, but let, but what what can you do about this? First, recognizing what it was, uh, you know, God helped me do that. And there's like, what do I do about this? And I'm like, I can talk to Tim. I looked at the time and I was like, it's, you know, it was probably like five o'clock. Maybe it was even six o'clock. I don't know. But I'm like, I can call Tim. I can just, I can, uh, you know, kind of share where I'm at. And I know that, I know that, that God will work through that and he'll, he'll help things. And, and that's exactly what happened. You know, I talked to him and right as soon as I was talking, we were able to just, you know, we were on the same page. I felt better. I remembered that I'm not alone in this, even though I knew I wasn't, but it was a good reminder. I'm not alone. Tim is there. Y'all are there. God is there, of course. And I just felt this incredible peace as we talk about, right? The peace of God that transcends all understanding suddenly was guarding my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And, yeah. uh, and it was incredible. And, I think if, if I can now, I'd love to transition. We, I, we will get back on, on our timing schedule. I know we're kind of used to this, but we're kind of not. If you're online joining us, thank you. I know our service has been going longer. It's just, again, it's a pivot, a change, and, and different things. But I'd love for us to take this last little bit of, of our time here to be able to break into some groups and pray. You know, as we talk about what did Nehemiah and uh, the Jews in Jerusalem do when they were facing adversity, they prayed, and they didn't just pray alone, but they prayed together, right? You know, what You know what was Tim sharing? You know, he was praying with people. What did I just share right now is praying, talking with people. And so we could take as long or as little time as we want for this. And, I mean, if you take a short amount of time, that's fine. If you take a long amount of time, that's fine, as long as we all can get out for supper eventually. Um, but truly, don't, don't feel like one is more spiritual than the other or whatever. But I would... I would challenge us to be honest and and to sh share a prayer request, something that we're challenged with personally, something that we would love for us to be praying about with our North Point family. Uh, you can break into groups as big or as small as you want. I don't want to control that too, too much. But I, I would think, you know, like three to five would probably be a, a nice number. Five might be a little bit much, maybe three or four, something like that. And just take some time to to pray together. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave... Mine at that point, but I'll let you uh, close off with any final thoughts before we break to, to pray with one another. Well, I find it interesting in the passage, there's so much we could draw from here, and I've got to be very quick, is that it's mentioned here in our passage that there was an awareness of those who were feeling very discouraged. And maybe as we come together in these little prayer cells, there will be people that will come to mind. Don't say their names. Just pray for them. Pray for them. Stand in the gap. Ezekiel 20 to 30. God says, I just look for one. Stand in the gap. Stand in the gap for them. Pray for them. They're in a spiritual battle right now, just as we are, which we'll talk more about later, not today. But if you could just remember them, okay? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd... We're just we're gonna call one more audible here, and then we will break into groups. I'd love to pray. This will be the close of of our time here together, and uh, and then you can break into your groups and pray. I would just like to read a prayer here. Oh God, you declare your um, almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.